Hello, my name is Deirdre Horgan. Um, I'm delighted to be speaking today at the Early Childhood Voices Conference. Um, I'm Senior Lecturer and Vice Head of School at the School of Applied Social Studies at University College Cork in Ireland. And today I'm going to present on teaching early years students about child voice. So just an overview of the presentation. Um, I'm going to begin by speaking more generally about approaches to teaching and learning in this space. Um, and then talk a little bit in more detail about teaching concepts about children's rights to early year students. Why should young children have rights? The philosophy um, and sort of disciplinary perspectives on that. And generally, um, I suppose, drawing from childhood studies views about childhood and children, how they've changed through historical periods of time, kind of postmodern concepts about childhood and how that situates children in terms of children's rights and children's voice. And then we'll talk about the UNCRC, some of the key principles and articles um, and how we teach that to early year students. And then talk a little bit in more detail about how this applies to early year settings. So how children's rights are recognised and respected in early childhood settings um, in the Irish context. Um, and then we go deeper into the training and more reflective learning about um, young people as students and as practitioners in early year settings, thinking a little bit about their positionality, talking about creative approaches to teaching children's rights to early year students, reflecting on the rights of the child in students' own practice and providing best practice exemplars in the exemplars in this field. So broadly speaking, my approach to teaching and learning in this field is drawing on a couple of key areas. The first is the importance of embedding key concepts. So the understanding of children's rights, recognition and appreciation and acknowledgement of children's rights, children as equal citizens, the philosophy underpinning that and the key theoretical perspectives underpinning that and a basic acceptance of that key value as early years practitioners, that children are equal citizens and as such have um, access to their rights and that as practitioners, it is our responsibility to help children to realise those rights. Um, that's combined with providing uh, and, and helping students to access key resource materials such as the UNCRC, supporting documents like NGO reports, um, uh, child participation toolkits, um, academic articles and online training resources. And then I suppose supporting that learning even further and embedding it further and helping students to think reflectively about what they're learning by doing in-class pop quizzes, um, polling students, testing their knowledge and their understanding through discussion, through walking debates, etc. And that's where I move on to the next point is, uh, I suppose, using creative um, and sort of activity based um, learning opportunities, such as walking debates and site visits. Um, so we find that this approach really scaffolds um, early year students learning. So we start, I suppose, with the basics. Why involve children? Why um, recognise children as equal participants? Why um, try to um, access children's voice and make it count in an early year setting? So we start from the broader perspective of um, the key principles of why it's important to involve children. Um, and so from a rights perspective, we teach students that um, this promotes children's citizenship and active inclusion. Um, by being participatory and involving children, children learn that they can make a difference and influence what happens in their environment. It helps them to discover their own value in their own right as citizens. So as well as that, involving children is more efficient. It creates better policy and better services all around. So children have their own unique perspectives. Nobody else can tell you what it's like to be a child, only a child. So their unique perspectives and experiences offer us um, an insight into issues that affect their lives, their likes, their dislikes, their preferences. And giving children a say in how policies and services are developed will help to ensure that those policies and services better meet their needs. 
And then finally, um, involving children helps uh, children themselves. Children gain so much from participation experiences. It helps them to develop teamwork, negotiation skills, problem solving and influencing. Um, it helps them to engage with adults as partners, builds their confidence and self-esteem. And it's particularly beneficial, as the literature tells us, for specific groups of more disadvantaged children, more marginalised groups like refugee and asylum seeking children, traveller children, children in poverty, etc. So we, we build on this concept of why, why rights are important for children by focusing in more specifically then on why rights are important for children, specifically in the early years. So. We use lots of materials and here we have some Bernardo's materials underpinning this. Um, so children, including the very youngest, must be respected as persons in their own right. Um, so that basic fundamental kind of philosophical approach of respect in the human integrity of young children. So and we really draw on childhood studies, children's geographies and that whole kind of new sociology of childhood movement, seeing children as active citizens, as um, key people with, uh, in families and in their communities, building relationships and networks, that children have uh, self-expression from the very earliest moment um, uh, and from the very earliest years, children can express themselves in lots of different ways, using lots of different languages, verbal and nonverbal. Um, and you know that we need to recognize the value intrinsic in recognizing uh, children's rights at an early age and promote children's um, opportunity to make choices. So we use lots of exercises and reflective pieces to work with students in looking at their own positionality um, and their own approach and their own um, biases and prejudices around children and working with children. And this is one exercise that helps them explore their own beliefs on the extent to which young children can and should be facilitated to make choices for themselves. So it's a very simple exercise. Jane Miller's work uh, is drawn on here about talking and listening. So we ask them to consider some of the phrases such as you're not big enough. How old are you now? Uh, play nicely, say please, you must share it, sit still, don't answer back, uh, say thank you, talk properly. And we ask them to consider those phrases and think about where or if they've heard those before, if they have, how many of how many of those phrases they've heard, in what settings, um, what was the reaction of the child, it could have been themselves, can they remember being spoken to like that and the impact it might have had on them? And that's a way into helping us think and talk a little bit about adult child relations, particularly the power dynamics in those relationships and how very often adults hold far too much of the power in those um, interactions with children. So having done some thinking about the broader concepts about children's rights, the rationale for children's rights um, and positioning yourself in terms of your views on children's rights, we move on to the broader kind of landscape, the policy context for child participation and voice. So we start with the international uh, landscape, so the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, um, and particularly um, focus on child voice, obviously Article 12, which is often known as the participation article which says that a child who is capable of forming his or her own views should have the right to express those views freely in all matters affecting the child and the views of the child being given due weight in accordance with age and maturity. We then talk at the EU level about uh, key policy documents um, which support and promote children's rights, particularly their right to participate. Um, and talk about, for example, the EU strategy on the rights of the child published in 2020, which aims to embed a child perspective in all EU actions. And we look at how that has um, been implemented and how it might have an impact on children in their everyday lives. And then we look at the national perspective in Ireland, where our own government has been very um, progressive in terms of promoting children's rights, particularly the right to participation. And so in 2015, we had a national strategy for children and young people's participation and decision making, the first of its kind in Europe. Um, and that was really an effort to ensure that all policy going forward would be child proofed so that any policy being um, developed by government would ensure 
if it was going to impact on children, would ensure that it involved consultation with children before any policy was published. Um, and so we've had a number of consultations with children. I've been involved in some of them myself on children's perspectives on healthy lifestyles, children's perspectives on school aged childcare, for example. And then more recently, last year, we have had the National Framework for Children and Young People's Participation in Decision Making. And this framework is uses the Lundy model of participation and tries to ensure that the commitment to children's participation is actually being implemented in all the key settings that children engage with schools, youth groups, um, uh, educate, you know, as I say, education settings, early year settings, um, their interactions with the Gardaí, etc., with social workers. And so there's a whole training model aligned with this national framework. Um, upskilling and capacity building practitioners who work with children in their daily lives to help them promote young people and children's participation. So, for example, here, first five is the Irish um, National Early Year Strategy published by government in 2019, and that commits the government uh, to developing methodologies to ensure that the voice of children is embedded in the implementation of early years strategies and structures being rolled out in the coming years. Um, so you can see in, in a lot of different elements of, of policy development, um, that child voice piece, the child participation piece is so important. So that's just an example of one of the resources that we use, um, and it, it helps students to understand the importance of using child friendly language um, when we're trying to explain the convention to children and we're trying to teach uh, and help children understand about their rights. Um, so that's a, a resource that's developed by the Children's Rights Alliance in Ireland. Um, and so we, we developed that kind of understanding of the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child. We have lots of in-class discussions and we look at the key principles and we do brainstorming with groups about what these key principles might be and the key provisions, the three P's, prevention, participation and protection. Um, so another way we uh, try to engage students in thinking about children's rights is a walking debate and we use materials developed by the Ombudsman for Children's Office. Um, so we, we ask young people and students to think about how children's rights are being respected um, in Ireland under the UNCRC. Um, and so we show them various statements such as, you know, you can see them there on the resource sheet. Children's rights are enjoyed equally by every child and young person living in Ireland. Um, failing to realise one right of children can have a big impact on whether they can enjoy other rights. And we, you know, take these individual statements and we do a walking debate. So we post agree on the left hand side um, disagree on the right position students in the middle, ask them to think about the statement and then position themselves one way or another or on the continuum. And then to reflect on that, to listen to people's arguments about why they position themselves where they did and maybe think about changing their position. And if they do change their position to explain why they, they've changed it and what has impacted that decision. Um, so that kind of reflection um, really helps students to think about their positionality on it. Um, and what has influenced their original views and thoughts. And we build on the debate then by sharing resources, pointing to, them, to the Ombudsman for Children's website to um, get relevant facts and statistics about children's rights in Ireland. We also have done site visits. So this is one, for example, a gallery in an art gallery in UCC, the Glucksman Gallery, which had a children's rights exhibition. Um, called Viewpoints, Children's Rights in Imaginary Spaces. And this is where the curators asked um, children's book illustrators to take key articles relating to children under the UNCRC and to think about uh, how they might illustrate that, um, you know, how they might visualise that and to produce a, a, a large illustration of that, which were then um, uh, put together to hold an exhibition in the Glucksman Gallery. So students got to see how various rights were interpreted by those children's illustrators um, and critiqued them. You know, um, felt, some felt they were very, very representative and uh, as they would understand it or that it would be relevant to a child, a child would get the meaning and others less so. 
So the opening slide um, of the, the dinosaur and the, the children on top as knights erecting a flag, that was the interpretation of Article 12, Children's Voice. Um, so then we talk a little bit in more detail about, tailor to the students about Ireland and the UN Convention, the monitoring process, how state signatories um, you know, report to the UN Committee. Ireland has had six state reports to date, and the most recent is this year, a consolidated fifth and sixth report because of the delays around COVID. There's a shadow report produced by the Ombudsman for Children's Office. Previously, the Children's Rights Alliance would have produced some of these shadow reports. And Ireland is due to have its next hearing in Geneva in 2023. And we will have our concluding observations on the committee then also. And I just wanted to show you, as we would with the students, some of um, the shadow report from the Ombudsman for Children's Office, which for the first time engaged with young children in the early years as to their likes and dislikes um, in order to feed that back to the UN Committee. And really, as you can see, there was lots of creative uh, methods used, particularly drawings and um, other, other kinds of activities. But you'll see from this, family features very heavily and play is really central to children's lives in the early years. Some of the things they didn't like was not being listened to, being hurt, going to hospital, um, and the things they'd like to change. And um, obviously this reflects the time when this research was done. They would like to end an end to COVID and to do more of what they like. So this gives us an indication of the importance of being listened to by children um, and, and for that to be followed through by adults. So we talked to our students a lot about different models of participation. So hearts, ladder of participation, moving from manipulation to, you know, um, child led initiatives um, and the Lundy model, which is used throughout Irish policy and strategies, um, which has uh, recognises four key elements of children's participation and voice. So that is space, voice, audience and influence. And then I suppose we look at how children's participation is embedded in the Irish early years sector. And we talk about policy, curriculum, uh, regulations, and in particular, Ashter and Shielta. Ashter um, in the Irish context is our national curriculum in early years. Shielta is our national framework for quality. And both of those emphasize the importance of children's participation, ensuring that children's rights are met um, and that that requires them to have choice and to use their initiative and to be, be supported to make decisions. So, you know, lots of discussion points with students about that. Did you see examples of children's participation in your placement settings? At the point that the students receive this module, they will have undertaken two block placements. So they'll have spent significant amount of time in practice, three months for each placement. Um, so they have the space and time now to reflect and think back on what they saw, observed and, and did themselves in terms of practice with young children. So if they saw examples of children's participation, were they meaningful or were they tokenistic? You know, how do they reflect on them now? We then um, propose a whole range of different participation activities that you can engage with with young children. We call this the participation toolbox, so listening games, icebreaker games, capacity building games, how to identify issues for discussion with children using a wish box graffiti wall, creative methodologies like mapping a centre, balloon work, placement work, and prioritising their preferences using voting, beans in a pot, sticky dot voting or ballot box voting. So we have a whole repertoire of exercises. And this is just one example here that we use from Amnesty International, um, which is very much based on kind of early years profile of, of, of children in a group. Um, and it's where children are asked to think about what they like and dislike in a setting. Um, or in the activities that are conducted in a setting. They can take photos, they can draw, they can model, whatever um, materials they like to use, they're, they're, they're supported in using. And the facilitator scribes what they're saying as they're drawing or taking photographs. And then this is extended by creating a diagram of the space or a map of the space and asking children to use um, a feeling faces sheet that they have. So cut out the faces and stick the relevant faces with their expressions onto the different parts of the map or parts of the diagram. And then finally, um, 
uh, your choice, your voice exercise builds on that again. What would make the class or the setting better? Um, if children have suggestions, how do we agree? So there's possibly voting exercises which helps children to learn about democracy, choice, compromise, making change. And I suppose the big part of that exercise is that, you know, you're helping children to identify what they like and dislike, how they might change it, and actually following up in terms of making some change so that children see the full impact of their voice, which is a key part of the Lundy model. So we ask students then, having explored all the different methods to discuss them, look at their usefulness, identify if and where they've seen them in practice and to suggest some others. And again, key discussion points would be what might be some of the challenges, you know, um, in particular for adults, they might see these exercises as costly, as time consuming. They may feel they don't have the capacity or the expertise to engage in this way with children. For children, sometimes also they find these participatory exercises can be quite challenging because they take a lot of time. Um, they don't understand a lot of the language adults use with them um, and it can be quite quite um, challenging for children in terms of their need for breaks. Um, they can be frustrated when adults don't follow up on things that they've agreed or discussed. So we talk through a lot of the challenges, some of them um, which are more, I suppose, difficult to, to engage with than others. And then we talk about the impact of hearing children's voices on, on settings and on practitioners. So the benefits for staff, for children, for parents and for the service of having this participatory early years um, approach. So improved dialogue and listening, children feeling more empowered and confident um, and also improving their own listening and um, parents becoming more supportive of children being vocal and participating and services becoming more responsive to children's needs. And then finally, here are some of the resources we use. So the Amnesty International Ombudsman for Children Resources, books on children's rights that are written specifically for children, young children, um, and then online resources, training resources, Children's Rights Alliance, Bernardo's Ireland have some amazing resources. So thank you very much for listening.